It's June 11th, 1962. I'm sitting in my cell just after supper. The guard finished his rounds a few moments ago, giving us our new packs of cigarettes, even exchanging our old razor blades for new ones. And now the other inmates are playing their instruments. It's music hour, if you can believe it. But even though I have a squeeze box of my own, I ain't playing it tonight. I'm on three hours of sleep, if that. And I'll be lucky if I get any at all in the next 24 hours. That's because I'm Frank Morris, prisoner AZ-1441. And tonight, I am escaping Alcatraz. It's the most famous prison in the world, a fortress set atop 22 acres of rock. There it sits in San Francisco Bay, a mile and a half across turbulent waters from Fisherman's Wharf. Maybe on a good day, you can make out the Golden Gate Bridge three miles away, if the fog is lifted, that is. And you ain't huddled up in your pea coat, cause even in June, it's 60 degrees Fahrenheit and the wind is always blowing. It started as a fort to protect the San Francisco Bay from foreign invaders. Then the Civil War broke out and San Francisco had its share of Southern sympathizers. Some of them hatched a plan to raid Alcatraz's arsenal in the dead of night, but the commander of the fort caught wind of it and his soldiers were waiting when they arrived. They were the first prisoners of Alcatraz, and it wasn't long before the other forts started to send their most dangerous inmates to do time on the isolated military base. And by the end of the war, Alcatraz was home to 49 prisoners. Then the 1906 San Francisco earthquake damaged so many jails on the mainland, they started shipping the civilian cons to the island. They were getting so many prisoners, they finally decided to build something large scale, something permanent. They made the convicts build their own prison, a cell house 480 feet long with six cell blocks for 600 prisoners. The mess hall, the infirmary, the showers, they were all in the same buildings as the cells, so we can be watched at all times. If you want to escape this place, you have to make it out of your cell, then out of the cell block, then out of the building, then down the cliffs to get off the island, then across the freezing waters of the bay to the open sea, or San Francisco, or nearby Angel Island, more than two miles away. Escape proof? That's what they say. Which is why it's been home to some of the country's most notorious criminals. Al Capone, Machine Gun Kelly, Bumpy Johnson, the place has three metal detectors. One on the docks for the boats, which is the only way on or off the island. One at the cell house entrance, and one on the main road, on the way to the work areas. The cafeteria is set up with what looks like picnic tables. Ten prisoners to each, so it's easy to keep track of our movements. A new electronic system has been put in place. Instead of individual keys, a series of levers hidden behind locked doors operates each individual cell door. That keeps the unarmed guards on the floor safe. So do the armed guards patrolling the platform suspended above each cell block. Alcatraz has one guard for every three inmates. The standard ratio is one to 10. They built this place with a fancy new steel for the bars that can't be bent or sawed. And even if you did get outside, guard towers with searchlights are set up on either end outside and manned 24 hours a day. Surrounding the main prison is a fence topped by razor sharp barbed wire. It keeps us away from the shore and from the families of the guards and staff who live on the island. But let's say you do somehow get all the way out of the water. Your only option is to swim for it. Boats have to maintain a 300-yard distance, and no one is allowed ashore or even to dock without a pass. And if you do manage to swim out to a boat that's waiting for you, how are you going to tell anyone to meet you? Mail is strictly censored. Magazines are delivered with articles cut out, and letters are retyped by guards to prevent any secret codes from getting through in the handwriting. There is no escape. But people still try. Before I came to the island, there were 12 attempts, and not one was successful. There's one from 1939 that's pretty infamous among us cons. Five guys make it out of D-Block, the most tightly secured block in the cell house, but they're discovered missing during the count. A watchtower guard spots them on shore trying to make a raft and he opens fire. One's killed, one's wounded. The others are sent to solitary. A lesson to always cover your tracks. Then there was the one in 1943. James Borman and three others jumped their guards at the Industries building. They should have planned it better. By the time they make it to the water, one of the guards is up and alerting the rest of the island. Borman is shot, his friends try to save him, but it slows them down. He dies. One is picked up in the water by police. Two others hide in caves for a while, but eventually return. A lesson that it's every man for himself. But the most famous is what they call the Battle of Alcatraz. Six men try to fight their way out of a botched attempt to get the keys to the outside. 
Instead, they wind up taking control of the cell house, with two of the guards as hostages. Two days later, the hostages have been killed and the U.S. Marines have shot three of the inmates dead. Of the remaining three, two get the gas chamber and one gets a second life sentence. A lesson in what happens when you try to use violence to get out. Otherwise, it's pretty standard. Guys try to make a run for it or even a swim for it and are either shot, caught, or drowned. Twelve attempts, zero successes. But here's the thing. I'm kind of an escape artist. From the age of 13, I've been in and out of jail and it's the only home I've ever really known. My parents abandoned me at 11 and two years later, I was already a convicted thief. It was just the beginning of a long criminal career. I served a stint in Louisiana's Angola prison for robbery, but after that, no prison would hold me. They sent me to Rayford Prison in Florida for breaking and entering, and within a year, I'd broken out of there. Eventually, I wound up in the U.S. Penitentiary in Atlanta, sentenced to 14 years for robbing a bank. Once again, I broke out in less than one. I guess that was the last straw for the feds. Once they recaptured me, they sent me to The Rock. They must have figured it's the only place that could hold me for good. Within a week of getting there, I got a job in the library. Stay quiet, keep to myself, but it's how I wind up reconnecting with Alan West. I met West back in Atlanta. Like me, he's escaped prison multiple times, even some of the same ones I did. Alan's a manipulator, knows how to talk to people. It's his second time in Alcatraz, and this time, he wants out on his own terms. He'll plot with anyone who'll listen. Well, I listen. He talks about the vents. There used to be eight exhaust blowers on top of the cell block, attached to the vents that opened up to the roof. They never really worked. Some were damaged over time. Now there's just one. Unused, unsealed, open. Problem is, you have to be on B block to access it. Okay, no problem. I keep my head down at the library. Official reports describe me as shy, reserved, blending in. So no one thinks twice when I request a transfer to B Block. So does West. Now we're rooming next to each other. He gets a job in maintenance, repairs, paint jobs, that kind of thing. He's supervised, but it's a job that sometimes gets him behind the walls. That's where he notices two things. First, a network of pipes leading all the way to the top of the cell block, which is where we need to be if we want to get at that vent. You could climb those pipes like a ladder. Second, decades of saltwater plumbing have corroded some of the pipes and flooded areas behind the wall. That's worn down the cement, making the walls porous and fragile, easier to chip through. Our afternoons out in the yard gives us more ideas. We keep close. It's always cold and wet, so me and West huddle together with some other guys we met in Atlanta. The Anglin brothers, John and Clarence. Backwoods Florida boys, no more than a third grade education. But they're on board with the plan too. And it's one of them who first suggests the idea of a raft. Not one made quickly at the shore like the other escapees, but an inflatable one. If we could make one of those ahead of time, we'd be golden. The Anglin boys get transferred to B Block 2, and cells right next to each other. It's too perfect. I have to thank the new warden, Alan Blackwell. Easy going, a reformer. Together with the new captain of the guard, he's setting a new standard of living on Alcatraz getting the harder-edged, more violent guards transferred. That suits me just fine. And they change more than just the guards. Remember those 10-man tables in the mess hall? Now, they're a cluster of smaller tables, like some fancy cafe. Four men can huddle around one, and guards can't hear what they're planning. Harder for them to see if we sneak any utensils out, too. Take a spoon, break off the bowl, file the handle to a sharp point, and you get a shank. Ours aren't for stabbing, though. We're using ours to chip away at our walls, right around the vent under the sink. A little bit at a time, one hour a night, every night. We use the music hour after dinner as our cover. There's a new addition too, giving the inmates time to practice their guitars, accordions, violins, saxophones. It's a whole bunch of caterwauling happening all at once. The perfect cover for four guys chipping away at the walls. We use soap chips to hide our work, painting them green with my art set to match the walls. I've also gotten an instrument on my own, a squeeze box. Fellas gotta have an instrument for music hour, Tony. Except, I never learned to play. I figure a way to use it as a pump to blow up the raft we're gonna make. And somehow no one notices. The prison is always understaffed. Other positions are either eliminated entirely or combined with other duties. That's how the mail censorship got so sloppy. We wind up with an issue of Popular Mechanics that shows how to design a life vest and survive cold waters. 
they never would have let that by a couple years ago. And the guard tower outside that's supposed to be manned 24 hours? Budget cuts means it's unmanned during the night, and the guy who's supposed to do the rounds on foot with a flashlight is more often night fishing. With the warden. The other guards get sloppy too. Too many of them are new, and they let Wes paint on top of the cell block. That brings him face to face with the vent. There, he can take a look and survey what we're up against. The inside of the vent leading up to the roof has two sets of bars. The first set is simple, just two rods that can be bent. The second is a grate held in place by 12 rivets. We're gonna have to drill those. Wes convinces them that he can't finish the paint job without kicking a lot of dirt and dust up on every guard and prisoner underneath, and we don't want that, do we? So he gets special permission to hang up blankets all along the perimeter. Now he's hidden from sight. It means I can work on the vent undercover. It's also where we stash the supplies to build our raft made out of 50 raincoats, our own, plus others smuggled to us by fellow inmates. Thanks, guys. That leaves us one tiny detail. How are we gonna break through our walls, climb up three stories, disassemble the vent, glue together a working raft, all without our absences being noticed by the guards when they do their rounds? We make masks, dummies, out of soap, concrete, and toilet paper. For the hair, we use actual hair John's kept from his job at the prison barbershop. We make them up to look like they're us sleeping in our beds. Every night, we put our dummies in place, cover up the holes in our cells with painted cardboard, and climb up the pipes to the top of the cell block. I bend the rods in the exhaust up top while the Anglins work on the raft. Now I've just got 12 rivets to deal with, can't unscrew them, and the makeshift drill we made from a motor of a vacuum cleaner is way too loud, so I have to saw them. June 10th, 1962. I never go back down after music hour, keeping the dummy head in my bed so I can open up that vent and get us to the roof. I work through the night. It's risky, but I manage to get the grate off without making a sound. The Anglins just finished making the raft. All that's left now is to pop open the top, but it's dawn. We'll have to wait till the next night. It's supposed to be business as usual throughout the day, but Clarence Anglin actually spends his time on the yard shaking hands with all of his pals, saying his goodbyes talk about subtle. We make it through dinner and back to our cells. We're there for the first round of checks, and we ask that the lights from A Block be turned off. Can't sleep with them on. And no one uses A Block anyway, right? Click. Off they go. I open up my fake wall, crawl through to the other side. Gotta be quick. I climb up the pipes till I reach the top where the vent is. I lower our stash of dummy heads down through the opening, then climb back down. I arrange my dummy head on the bed. Roll up some blankets underneath the sheets. Looks good. Grab my cigarettes, put on my coat, back out I go. I replace my wall from the other side. We use some plaster to make it look like it's part of the wall too. And up I go. The Anglins and I grab everything from their hiding place. The raft made out of raincoats, the bellows made from the squeeze box, life jackets made from other raincoats, and paddles made from screwed together planks of wood. Only thing left now is to get west. Well, Remember the plaster we made to disguise the walls? Wes has hardened up. He can't get out. He's panicking, kicking his wall, using his coat to muffle the noise. He wants us to wait. We made the paddles after all. And he's the one who told me about the vent more than two years ago. But it's now or never. I tell him to keep trying. We'll wait as long as we can. And I climb back up the pipes. It's after 10 by the time I'm back in the vent. Once again, all that's left is to pop open the top. It's lighter than it looks. The wind on the roof blows it out of my hand. With a thud, it lands on the roof. Everyone hears it, even the seagulls, flying around now, screaming in panic. But there's no one at the guard tower, no one to immediately react. I climb out. John Anglin feeds me our stash through the hole, everything we need to survive on the raft, plus the raft itself. Then he joins me. His brother Clarence follows. We leave a paddle and a life vest behind for West. If he makes it in time, fine but it's not my problem anymore. We run across the roof. I lead the way. We make it to the west end, right where the bakery exhaust pipe runs the full length of the building. I toss our stuff over the wall, hoist myself atop the parapet, grab the pipe, shimmy down 45 feet to the bottom. The Anglins follow close behind. We pick up our bundle and run across the fence, climb over, barbed wire and all. We crawl along the catwalk the guards use to watch the yard. We cut a line of barbed wire so we can make it to the other side, to the 10-foot drop. We're out, but we've still got the rest of the island to cover. We run straight for the shore, right past the officer's clubhouse in the residential area. 
Luckily, there's no one outside. We slide down a steep hill, all the way down to the shoreline. We roll out the raft and inflate it with the squeeze box. We blow it up until it's fit to ride. It's not even midnight. I can see the lights of the city across the bay. John plugs up the valve when it's all ready. This is it. The moment of truth. Maybe the raft isn't seaworthy. Maybe one of the screws and the paddles will pop loose. Maybe the current will drag us out to the Pacific. Maybe one of us will betray the others. Maybe it'll be me who betrays them. But for now, we're in the raft and I'm paddling away. No shots have been fired. No alarms rang. For now, I'm doing the impossible. For now, I am escaping Alcatraz.